what is the connection that Hari Parj uh, had with the Greeks? Uh, Harry Parch was obsessed with ancient Greek culture, as a matter of fact. He really thought that basically things have sort of gone downhill since the Renaissance. <laughs> and that he said the older he got, the further back he went to look for truth. So in terms of music uh, and his ideas about tuning and that sort of thing, the ancient Greeks were very involved with tuning and scales because back then music was considered a science that could actually help describe what is going on in, in life. I mean, think about, think about geometry, right? Or, or Ptolemy or uh, Pythagoras. They were measuring things and that helped explain the world around them. And for them, uh, actually a vibrating string became a reflection of nature somehow. So they came up with all sorts of ways of tuning strings of dividing them into halves and thirds and fourths and fifths and uh, using uh, arithmetic proportions and geometric proportions all the stuff that we had to learn in high school about the concepts of geometry they applied to strings and of course there was a musical result for that so because harry was so interested in the old tuning systems that's really what got him started on uh, on greek music theory but he also loved the greek myths he loved the concepts of using the myths as archetypes. Today we talk about psychology, of course, and personality, but in the old days they used to tell stories about the human existence by talking about the gods, and Apollo would represent perhaps the sun, and Eros was love. And these were concepts, of course, but they told the stories about how humans inter, inter, uh, interleaved themselves um, by using these myths. So he was very interested in that as well. The first opera he wrote was about Oedipus, King Oedipus, which is of course a famous Greek myth. And ironically, he had a very twisted relationship with his mother, so that makes perfect sense, right? And later on, he actually did an opera that was based on the Bacchae of Euripides. So he knew, he was very well read, he knew his ancient Greek uh, culture, not only the uh, the mathematics and the philosophy, but also the drama and the, uh, the comedies. What was the importance in, in the musicology that Harry Parch brought with his approach to music? Interesting question. Because that came later in his life. Initially, he was intrigued by simply using the human voice. He said that was the source of all music. And his first instrument was something called, uh, he called it a monophone. It was really a viola with a cello, a long cello neck. I actually have one here, uh, a copy that I made. And the whole idea was make music follow the contours of the human voice. That's where he got started. And that's a very simple concept until you start trying to write down the human voice. And as you know, we do not speak in scales. If we did, it would be a musical, right? We speak and we glide our notes. And he was finding that he couldn't find those notes on the piano. And he suggested he needed musical instruments that followed the human voice. The human voice shouldn't follow the instruments we already have. And that was part of his development of the so-called microtonal scale. Uh, later on, as he continued to explore different traditions, in the 1930s he did a lot of research and ended up finding out about the ancient Greeks, for one, but other world traditions, Hindustani music, for example, or Chinese music, uh, Middle Eastern music, they all had different modes and different scales that he could relate to mathematically because he was very interested in tuning them correctly. But that opened up a whole world of what we now call, of course, ethnomusicology. He was also intrigued uh, with the concept of how music fit in other cultures. Because other cultures, music is part of the culture. It's not something you go into a room and dress up in a suit and tie and go listen to, as was true in the early part of the 20th century when he was living. That art music was something over there, wasn't a part of life. He felt that music should be part of life. and. He did pay attention, close attention, to how other cultures embedded music into their lifestyle. 
And that's how his, his ethnomusicological slant came about. He was also intrigued uh, with different, different countries' music. When he lived in San Francisco, he would go to the Chinese opera with Lou Harrison, for example. And uh, he, he explored different ways that humans have expressed themselves musically. Did Harry Parch uh, seek the, the knowledge of like, um, inst Greek instrument builders? He did, in fact. When he was in uh, London, he got a grant in the middle of the Depression to go study uh, ancient manuscripts and old writings about tunings at the British Museum. And while in London, he met a woman named Kathleen Schlesinger, who was a, a musicologist, not an ethnomusicologist, but she was interested in ancient Greek music. So much so, in fact, that she wrote papers about how they tuned the old pan pipes, and she made herself a, a kathara, or a kithara, if I'm still not sure exactly how you pronounce that. But she had done a lot of research at all herself and seen, as so many people had before, pictures on ancient Greek vases of these wonderful lyres and katharas. And she actually had, uh, had someone make one for her. And when Harry was in London and he visited her, and boy, did they hit it off, because he knew exactly what she was talking about. And her study, her, the sense of old Greek music, not very many people knew about that, so she was thrilled to talk to him about it. So Kathleen Schlesinger really helped him talk about some of the old modes, some of the old instruments, and perhaps how the music was actually used. Because we're not really sure, of course we don't have any recordings, and we have very little music also. But we do have theory textbooks from ancient Greece. So they were able to talk a lot about ancient modes, and she helped a lot. Mm -hmm.